No, we'll get started here. Uh, I'm Jim Hall, uh, past president, owner of Systems Management and Balancing, fortunate enough to uh, get the business sold and ha have it keep going with two former employees. So they're taking over. I'm doing a lot of consulting now, doing things like these presentations and things in that fashion, and then staying in touch with the industry still. I've only been involved in it, I think, uh, 37 years, so I don't think I can go cold turkey right away. So uh, presentation, I like open format. You have questions or things or something doesn't make sense, we're on it. No problem, bring it up. Let's talk about it real quick while we have it up. I know they might want to get the mic to you so they don't really like that too much, but I have no problem. Let's interact, let's get it going, and if we run out of time, we run out of time. So um, I don't think we will, but I'll uh, try to stay quick and keep going. So I like going through all these slides here. So big thing on learning objectives. Um, understand the proper use application limitations of tab instrumentation. Um, there's a lot of misnomers about some of the instrumentation, the accuracy, the use, and that type of thing. Um, understand what's accurate, useful, meaningful data. Really data obtained in the field versus data obtained in the laboratory. Um, trying to get that across so you understand that we can get some decent data. A big part of getting that is understanding the HVAC systems and the tab measurement process. So how to set a system up or how should the system be set up to get the data that we're looking for. Um, and then the big thing is promote a team approach to address schedule challenges, uh, design issues, reviews, and anything else that we're coming across. A lot of times we run, you know, the, the tab industry is known as the bearer of bad news. Great news, tab guy's on site. He's here, we're gonna be done with the job soon. Bad news is tab guy's on site because he can find problems and we're gonna have to fix them. So promote that team approach to try to get those issues revolved, resolved in that fashion. <clears throat> Really, the big thing that I like to promote is the fact that um, I'm just a guy from Texas A&M, don't know a whole lot of things, but I'm very fortunate that I've had a whole lot of good people that I've been able to work with through the years. Through that, that's really what's developed this presentation. Um, it's working with all the people from the company, from the industry, customers, uh, even competitors and stuff, and working through them and learning different things of what we see out there. Uh, we have the one thing in the tab industry and commissioning world that a lot of people don't see. We get to see it work. We get to see the individual components put together in a system, and now it's time to make the system work. So that's a lot of what I've put together through here is working through that kind of thing. Uh, eyes and ears of the design professional, uh, and putting this stuff together so we can just share lessons and we go through it and see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. One of the big things that we always like to start with really is uh, what we call a project document review, both in the commissioning process or the tab process. And anything we can do on paper before it's installed in the field is going to be a big savings, not only monetarily, but time-wise, which is money, headache-wise, uh, conflict-wise, and that kind of thing. So if we can get through and get a document review done as early as possible, love to promote that. Pre-design, you know, before they really start getting everything hard and fast on the drawings, get through, get through those documents. In the tab world, we're looking at functionality. We're looking at accessibility. And a lot of times we are looking at those combinations of, um, is that system gonna work with all those different components put together? Because we actually, in the long run, are the ones who have to make it work in the field. So trying to get those things in mind all goes right into the caveat of our data and what data we produce. Because the data we produce is based on the system design, equipment selection, system installation, system operation, and the proper use of our tab instrumentation. So the data that we're able to get is predicated by those items right there. If anything there deviates, it doesn't let us get data, doesn't let us operate the system a certain way, uh, we don't have access or whatever, the data is not going to be probably what you want to see when you're looking at that report. We always like to term meaningful data, sometimes repeatable data. Accurate is always kind of a misnomer to a point because what is accurate? Um, what's going to benefit the project? We like to look and say, is the data we're going to get and present and ask to get and present going to be meaningful to the project and the design professional? 
Are they going to be able to take that data and use it appropriately to say the system's functioning to design intent? Overall goal of what we do, try to get information so that we can prove design intent. So thinking of those things in that side, we know a lot of times specifications will have a ton of information listed of what's to be got or obtained in the field, what we're supposed to report and that type of thing. But let's step back and take a look and say, one, is that data useful and meaningful? Is it going to help evaluate the system? And two, time's money. And if we're out there spending a bunch of time trying to get data that is not meaningful or useful to the project or owner, we're spending the owner's money that probably he doesn't want to spend. So it's always a caveat. I never want to have people think that we're trying to promote shortcuts. We're trying to get away from doing things. We're trying to promote what's right for the project. And sometimes getting data that is tough to get needs to be gotten. And we just have to work through a way of getting that data. You know, some of that data that we look at and some of the typicals are wet bulb temperatures. Always a big one. We'll always get reports rejected or reviewed and looked at and saying, hey, you don't have any wet bulb temperatures. We like to look and say, one, to get them, we need one to get a accurate or a stable load, a latent load, end sensible load on that coil. Without that, the data we're going to get of that leaving air temperature and leaving wet bulb temperature is not going to be really a meaningful number if we don't have a load on it. Second part is, is it going to be a stable load? Not only for the entering air temperature coming in the coil, but also if it's chill water, is our chill water the right temperature? Are we at design conditions? So a lot of times we'll say get wet bulb temperatures. A lot of times we'll say, hey, take your air numbers and your temperatures calculate a BTU, take your water numbers, calculate a BTU, if it deviate more than 10%, go rebalance. That's where it becomes difficult to look and say, are those numbers really the numbers we can get and are they really meaningful numbers? You know, to get a traverse of temperatures as opposed to single point temperatures is required to get that kind of data. A laboratory setup really helps when get that kind of data. So look at what data we're trying to get and is it meaningful and do they need it for the project? There could be a project that does need wet bulb temperatures, and if we need to get those, and we need to work together as a team to figure out how are we going to measure them, how are we going to establish a load, and how are we going to get that data that's going to be useful when we get that. So same thing we see a lot of times entering dry bulb temperatures on a condensing unit sitting outdoors. Um, is it really meaningful data? Is it really useful data? What's the load on the compressors at the time and all that? So. Can it give you a snapshot that something's functioning? Yes. So if we're going to look at some temperatures and say, hey, are we close to functioning and something like that? Hey, good information. But sometimes when we're trying to get down to the details, is this system really performing? We've got to step back and look and say, how much more detail do we have to get into and get in that data? Same thing when we start looking at that when we're getting that data is how do we set up the system? You know, it's uh, funny, you'll look a lot of times, a, a tab guy will get out there and get going and we'll get work and we'll get some data. Oh, we're hitting design numbers. Things look great. Put it in the report, let's go. Lo and behold, we got design numbers, but we were operating in a mode that the system's never going to operate in. We just got lucky and got the numbers. So really, we need to step back and look and say, is the system set up correctly to get the numbers? So variable volume air handling system. So we've got a connected load of 12,000 CFM, air handling unit size for 10,000 CFM. We have diversity. How do we want to get a total airflow on that air handling unit for final airflow data? In addition to the fact it's got an economizer, it's got minimum outdoor air, how are we going to set up that side of it when we run our test data? And I can tell you in most conditions for TAB situations, we try to set up the worst case or maximum flow condition, with the premise being, if we can make the 12,000 CFM, or in this case, the 10,000 of the air handlers a minimum, we should be able to make all other operating conditions. Let the control system control it from there. So when we start looking at that data, we not only want to make sure we can get good data, but we need to make sure as a tab company that we've talked to the design professional, we've worked with the people, and said, how do you want us to set the system up to get that data? And a lot of times we should be able to tell you that in the report, that that total airflow is a duct traverse. VFD was at 58 hertz. Um, connected load was 12,000 air handler size for 10. 
we indexed all VAV boxes at maximum airflow at time of test. That way you know what was done and what's happened and the data now makes sense. So it's not only just getting the right data, but it's also setting systems up correctly to do that. Um, and sometimes you might have to do two modes. You might have uh, a normal mode and an emergency mode, a um, natatorium system. And you gotta go into an emergency purge mode for when they have a chemical issue. So when you hit that purge button, everything's gonna go to max. But in normal operation, you might only be running maybe at 70% or something. So you might have to set up multiple test modes and, that, and do that to get the right data so everything can be evaluated properly. So when you're doing that document review and you keep going through things, you're thinking of one, how can I get the data? What data do I need? And those different things. You just start looking at the systems too and say, okay, in the top example with the blue duct and I guess the brownish tap, that's the do design document. It shows an existing system tapping off a riser with 10 3000 CFM outlets and a 9500 CFM duct tap coming off of it. The only thing the documents say to do is get 9500 CFM at that tap. We don't know what's supplying it. We don't know if there's other additional things off that duct riser that's serving that floor. Do we serve other floors? Um, and we don't know what to do with those other 3000 CFM outlets. So I guarantee you this, we're short of airflow. We'll just start closing those other outlets and we'll get our 9500 CFM. So when you're doing that document review, look at it. You know, you should do a presentation review also. Uh, heat pump six serves three existing outlets, exactly like it serves four existing outlets in the lower diagram. So we have four existing outlets. They tapped off two new rooms, put the outlets and said, okay, I need the one at 250 and the one at 50. What do we do about the other four outlets? Because I guarantee you, we could probably get the 250 and 50 out of those two outlets, just close those others if we need to. But what have we done to the system? So some small examples of what's going on with systems, but a lot of times we'll see this in larger systems overall, especially in a lot of remodels, uh, retrofits and those kind of things, that really we should have been given the airflow for the other four outlets in those situations. So document reviews can help a lot of things up front and get a lot of things taken care of. And if you can imagine, if you can take care of all that kind of stuff before a bid, so everybody's gonna know what to do. Do they need to modify that other ductwork? Do they need to blank off the 3,000 CFM outlets? They didn't show it. You know, different things like that you can bring up that all of a sudden now we need to look at. So when you look at the data too, one thing we look at is tolerances. And a lot of times in the specifications we'll see uh, zero to 10%, plus or minus 5% and those type of tolerances. Be careful looking at tolerances. Tighter tolerances isn't always better. It doesn't always mean a better job. Uh, the one thing you have to look at is one, tab instrumentation, what are the tolerances on that? I'll show that on the next slide. Another thing is your DDC system. You, if you have a zero to 10% balance spec and you're gonna balance everything from zero to 10% and you got it on a VAV system, is your VAV controlling at your set point from zero to 10%? Most of them don't. Most of your controllers won't control from a zero to 10. They'll have a range of a plus or minus. So when you go back out to prove up and everything, you got some minuses showing up, you didn't balance it right. You need to be zero to 10. Well, okay, we'll lock it in at a damper position at that point and go through it and then we'll be plus 10 when we're locked in at an airflow. So you have to look and say, will the control system even control to the tolerances of what we're to balance to? Um, the other thing, everybody thinks, hey, we have a lab, we have an OR, we have a critical room, we need plus or minus 5% tolerances. This is a very, very important facility. Keeping in mind now, the mechanical engineer does his design layout, does everything, gets his airflow set, and does everything predicated on a certain amount of leakage for that OR. If the OR isn't built very tight, we're gonna need a lot more airflow to make room pressure. Room pressure airflow changes are gonna dictate your final airflow in that room, not trying to stay within a 10% tolerance or a 5% tolerance. A lot of ORs don't end up in that tolerance of the airflow because we gotta get more airflow typically um, to get that room pressure. You know, and then we stay above the air change per hour rate. So don't get hung up on tolerances and thinking, I need a tight tolerance because I've got a hospital, I've got an OR, I've got uh, a compounding room, I've got a pharmacy to work with. So things like that, you gotta step back and look and say, 
what's going to affect that. The other piece of that would be what is installed to allow for the balancing to get the tight tolerances, what is installed to allow for the control to those tolerances. So we need to look at those things. We'll look at a couple balancing things down the road here on being able to get tighter tolerances when we are balancing. Like I said, on the equipment side, this is out of a short ridges manual. You'll see this is very similar numbers, Evergreen, Dwyer, et cetera. So if we take a uh, airflow reading, uh, the very bottom one that's highlighted in that color, um, accuracy is plus or minus 3% of reading, plus or minus 7 CFM from 100 to 2,000 CFM. So at 100 CFM, 3% is 30, 3% uh, is 3, plus or minus 7 is 10, plus or minus 10%. So you're plus or minus 10% of low airflows. Majority of all your tab equipment, lower airflows, lower velocities, lower accuracy. Get up to 2,000 CFM, you're like one point, uh, what is it? Just, you're just over 3%, basically, is what it's going to boil, boil down to. So higher velocities, higher airflows, more accurate reading. So you have to be careful on that side when you're looking at tolerances on that side. And a lot of times now, um, a lot of outdoor airflows, a lot of DOS systems. Um, to presentation yesterday on, um, um, oh gosh dang it, I just totally forgot the word. Uh, the ventilation, um, God, who was in that tab seminar yesterday on the diffusers? Induction diffusers, thank the induction side. You've got 40 CFM induction a lot of times coming in on your outside air systems into a induction diffuser or a chilled beam. And getting those airflows a lot of times is a tough airflow measurement. So one of the big things, speaking about outdoor air, DOAS type units, outdoor air has become a very big thing with our recent situation. I try to stay away from talking about the pandemic and all that good stuff because I've kind of had enough. I'm sure you all have also. Um, but setting a system up so outdoor airflow can be measured. Um, you know, the right side, they did a great job of a minimum outdoor air duct and economizer duct all tied together going to the outside louver right behind the unit. We have airflow monitoring stations in those taps that do not control accurately because of the velocity profiles. There's no way to traverse the duct. There's basically no way to get an airflow measurement into that unit. So thinking of how once again, in a design review, how are we going to measure outdoor airflow? Is outdoor airflow important to this job? If it is, let's make sure we got some duct work, we get some duct traverses, we can get some measurement methods. You know, typically that room is tight, so you just transition that duct up so you can walk underneath it, get it over to your unit, still no place to traverse. So once again, that document review, you can do a lot of damage in just trying to get things squared away of, if outdoor airflow is important, we got to get some measurements. We need to get some ductwork to be able to traverse it. Same thing when you look at rooftop units. Um, we'll talk about it later. No, you can't take the flow hood and put it on the back end of the unit and get an airflow measurement. Will not work. Um, so how do we get outdoor airflow measurement on a rooftop unit? You know, a lot of times we'll take a duct traverse to the return duct and a duct traverse to the supply duct and take the difference between the two and get an outdoor air measurement that way when it's operating in the minimum outdoor air. So there's some different ways you could do things. You're going to do temperature difference. If you do a temperature difference, I think the number is 25 degrees between return air and outdoor air is required to get an accurate temperature difference. Plus, the hard part is getting a mixed air temperature then. So sometimes you might have to make sure your heat's turned off, your cooling's turned off, put it in minimum outdoor air, get down into the space and get your mixed air temperature coming out of that first diffuser or right out of the supply duct and get it right there where you know you've got a good mixed air temperature. So some things like that you have to look at. Difficulty, I'm in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. A lot of old school remodels always are happening. Old days, no cooling in the schools. Now we're adding cooling. So they'll take out the heating only unit vent and now we'll run four pipe or run a two pipe changeover system and we'll put in a new unit vent. So just in a job we were just looking at, engineer specifies a minimum CO2 CFM and a maximum CO2 CFM for every unit vent. I don't know how we're gonna measure the airflow. And he sat back and we're going through it when it's uh, bidding. I said, hey, we'll 
look at manufacturers damper curves you know we keep a spreadsheet in our office of a lot of rooftop units and damper positions and when we're able to get some good accurate airflow, airflow measurements we start seeing where damper positions are correlating to an airflow so we try to use some of that data to help out to set damper positions and do that but to come in and give them a definite hey yeah we got 55 cfm at uv 27 207s probably isn't going to happen uh, the one thing we've learned in the tab business if we put a number on a report even though it might have a note tied to it that says this number is a range based on this situation that number's still gospel and people will always hang their hat on that number so you get a little nervous sometimes putting numbers in a report because people always will take it as gospel without looking at all the notes so um, and that side so be careful of outdoor air be careful what you're looking at there if you know that's what they're going to look at in design phase and you're starting to go through it and you're sitting in that meeting you can say hey by the way outdoor air measurements are going to be difficult so we need to look at that if that's going to be a criteria for you guys airflow monitoring stations everybody you, you know put them in they're going to take care of they get airflow measurements pretty much you look at it as a duck traverse uh, if it's not in a good location you're not going to get a good measurement um, they do require filtering so that's the one blown up picture that's the uh, dust bunnies all collected onto the airflow monitoring station and why they had a pressurization problem at a hospital because all their airflow monitoring stations for their outdoor air were basically not working right once they're all cleaned you can hear the hospital breathe and settle back down when all the dampers went to the right position controlling to their minimum outdoor air uh, the rooftop on the left those are all filled with water uh, from a rainstorm the night before uh, unfortunately they had all their outdoor air openings facing due north in Iowa on the roof and that wasn't a good idea with the prevailing north winds we get with all the rain they were all full of water they couldn't figure out why they were having issues with their outdoor air in the facility follow the guidelines of that side they didn't update the presentation so uh, I, Ross Montgomery's not in here is he Ross just published an article ASHRAE featured technical article April 2022 he's got on a whole article basically on that right there of making sure you are addressing your airflow monitoring stations and they have filtered air you have, they're in the right places great little article good case study the whole works on this whole slide right here so uh, that just came out this month um, speaking of that with airflow monitoring stations it goes right into the duct traverse we live by a duct traverse that's what we like to measure airflow with that is the gospel it's not the flow hood it's not face velocity measurements um, it is a duct traverse so if we can get a duct traverse we are comfortable we are happy if we have a good location to get it uh, basically round duct two and a half diameters from the condition for up to 2500 feet per minute uh, add one diameter for each additional hundred feet per minute a rectangular duct formula there to get your uh, equivalent length and get that there I'll show you with how that equates in the next slide keeping in mind accuracy is better when it's above a thousand feet per minute uh, once again we just saw those numbers yesterday on the uh, induction diffusers they had a bunch of traverses I think they're ranging in that 300 to 400 feet per minute and found out they were not that accurate because it was such a low velocity and their spreadsheet was great because right at 500 feet per minute accuracy started picking back up and 500 to a thousand semi acceptable above a thousand they were spot on with the numbers that they should should have been so always don't forget the thousand feet per minute they unfortunately had I think oversized duct going to a bunch of their outlets so So when you look at that and you sit there and say in a 30 by 20 duct 10,000 CFM at 2400 feet per minute you're going to need at least six foot of straight duct to meet that requirement for a duct travelers and I know architects are giving us room all the time you need more space don't you hey I'll give that to you we'll get bigger duct we can get straighter runs life's going to be great happens all the time so uh, in fact that's a picture of our building there and it goes back to the mechanic room on the left and I didn't even get as big a mechanical room as I wanted but I did get my straight ducts so but I was laughing they were no we need this look we've got to have this look at this duct going down I, we can't have that mechanical room come all the way out you know 
and it's always so funny what they're looking at and trying to get with that architect, which is great. Uh, studies years ago, BOMA study, number one reason somebody moves into a building, how it looks. Number one reason the occupant leaves the building, occupant comfort. So uh, you got to find the happy medium between the two. Um, alternatives to a duct traverse. Um, if we cannot get a good tra duct traverse, we don't have a location, a lot of times we'll try one. And if we can get one that gets us the stable velocities and based that first paragraph to stay in, we get good velocities that are all close to each other, they're above 1,000 feet per minute, we might, we've got a good duct traverse. We're going to feel good about that number and look at that. A lot of times we don't have it. Um, and when we don't have it, we got to start looking at alternatives. You know, could be a coil face velocity, could be a filter face velocity, um, could be a measure your outlets and sum your outlets, um, could be summing up all your calibrated VAV boxes. There are a couple different ways. I can tell you this a lot of times, you'll want to look at a couple of them maybe. If you can add your outlets up and maybe get a coil velocity and see how they correlate and have that, maybe report both measurements get you a ballpark range, because sometimes you just don't have a good method to get an airflow measurement. If you can't get duct traverses, it's very, very difficult sometimes. The one thing also, tab instrumentation, a lot of times we'll see people out there with um, uh, thermal anemometer hot wire, and using that, keep in mind unidirectional device. It does not read reverse airflow in a negative number, or a zero, or an error reading. It'll give you a number and it'll be a positive number. So if you're using a thermal anemometer, be very careful in a duct traverse, because if you've got swirl, you've got backflow, it's not gonna pick it up, so. One thing, and really the thing I've always hung my hat on since February 2006 ASHRAE article with the architects and people looking at this and going through is, why do I need more duct space or more mechanical room space to get a straighter duct run? Um, I'm not being selfish now. Canadian school study of roughly, I think, 30 schools in their district went through and figured out where they had poor fan performance, went back through, used the AMCA publication to calculate the system effect, went back there and said, if we didn't have system effect on this fan and on these systems, what kind of money would we save as a school district? The one example of just one fan down here, they had, they had a savings of 6.7 brake horsepower, roughly $1,200 per year. One fan, one motor. 30, 30 schools. They went there and then did the whole life cycle analysis on that for 25 years of useful life, um, $86,000 for that uh, 6.7 brake horsepower loss. Now it starts making a difference. And now you have something that you can say, hey, by the way, Mr. Owner, looks beautiful, love it. However, you're going to be spending more money in your energy because this transition coming off the Sarah Hammer is really not that effective as far as efficient for your energy. You know, that was one of the biggest things is by not trying to save dollars per square foot by reducing the size of the mechanical room, the increased operating cost of the poor installation like to be far greater than the cost of providing the space necessary to ensure a good duct installation. One thing also, we start seeing now in duct traverses and trying to get airflow measurement, we see a lot more fabric duct now. So a lot more fabric ducts being utilized. Uh, a lot of people like the exposed duct, a lot of people like the fabric duct. Don't have any issues with it other than the fact that give us enough metal duct before you connect the fabric duct to get a duct traverse. Uh, you know, this is the profile view. This is a, a sports facility that just opened up in West Des Moines, Iowa. And this was the elevation view of how it was supposed to go through the wall and that type of thing. Um, go out, go above the ice rink, and serve the ice rink. We were lucky that we got with the contractor ahead of time and he got much smoother transitions and actually this area right here, he increased this with a smooth straight transition with metal duct to allow us to get a traverse and we were lucky enough that was right above the mezzanine, above the ice rink. So we can get onto that mezzanine, traverse those and get good airflow measurements. So the fabric duct, be careful if all of a sudden you've got that fabric duct collar slid on as close as possible, no place to get a traverse. You know, a lot of times you might be looking and saying, okay, I'm gonna look and see how that duct's inflated, um, especially with a rooftop unit where you might not be got coil velocities or anything else. We're gonna see how it's inflated. 
Is it overinflated, underinflated? Take a look at it that way. You might not be able to get an airflow measurement on it. So be careful with fabric duct if you're looking at documents going through that and saying, how are we going to get that airflow measurement? Earlier, I mentioned our wonderful flow hood. Uh, used to be known as a magical device. Just put it on, tells you an airflow. Um, we find out more and more it's being misused quite a bit. But these days now, people are getting more educated. I think a lot with commissioning side because they're using some of the instrumentation now, wondering why some numbers they're getting aren't matching and doing some different things. So more use of the instrumentation is also finding out that people have to use it correctly. Um, the manufacturers basically publish it's a proportioning device. It's not an airflow measurement device. It can become an airflow measurement device if you develop a K factor, but the simple things of, unfortunately, CETA and a couple other organizations, a couple manufacturers of fume hoods, that's how they tell you to test a fume hood. If you think about it overall, you got a six foot square opening at 18 inch high by four foot opening. You're going to tape off half of it and put a 14 by 14 opening, the base of that hood, to measure the airflow through that fume hood now. Is that how it operates? So it doesn't. And oh, by the way, if you have a single fan serving that, you could easily overload the motor in that, that condition because you're now going to cut back all your airflow, raise your static. You're going to say, I don't have enough design airflow. You're going to tell the owner he's got to change his fan motor out to get more airflow in that condition, which it'll never operate in. So the sad part of our industry is still promoting this. I try, you try to talk to some of these manufacturers and stuff. They're not getting it. One guy finally asked, well, I got an outdoor air louver serving this building, right? He goes, yeah. So okay, I'm going to go blank off two thirds of it and measure the amount of outdoor air coming through that opening. And that's going to be the amount of outdoor air coming into your building. Because you can't blank it off. It's using that whole louver. And then he caught himself and said, oh, hold on. We need to look at our manuals. So a lot of it's just education, talking through, going through things, understanding that that flow hood has some challenges and needs to be used. That's a paragraph out of uh, Short Ridge's manual. It may require the development use of a correction factor. It doesn't like high jet velocities going through it. Uh, Reverse airflow when you're reading exhaust or return reads totally different than when the airflow is going through it um, in a supply fashion. Um, security diffusers, laminar flow, doesn't like those. Um, even a lot of your uh, duct mounted grills now and supply grills are, are a challenge also. Hood doesn't like reading those. So I can tell you one thing if you do have them, like the one lower right hand corner, <clears throat> take your deflectors, bend, have them go out to the side. Um, and deflect off that hood base so it's not a jet velocity right through that hood. Um, to show some numbers, we had a large project that had a bunch of the Ponca eyeball nozzle type diffusers on it. So we were lucky, they were all served by a heat pump. So you had a heat pump serving six to 10 of them. In certain cases, we got very lucky that we can duct traverse that four inch duct going off to that diffuser. And we can duct traverse that to set up a way to develop a factor using either a rotating vane, airfoil, pitot tube, or flow hood. One thing you notice with the flow hood, you can see the cardboard plate in there. That's, we call it a blast plate. It was put in there for the one purpose of diffusing the airflow off of the, off the grid so it doesn't jet down through it in that side. So, um, in fact, probably the gentleman sitting here somewhere is a gentleman who developed Stewie Moen back in the back years ago when he used to work for our company started playing with and worked with Short Ridge on what they, they could do to help try to get that. So we did flow hood with blast plate and we did flow hood without blast plate. So we got different measurement methods. We did three measurements and to be safe, we had one tech work on one heat pump and do it. We had another tech do a different heat pump while he was working and he came back and a different tech with different instrumentation we did it also again. So repeated the numbers, six different measurements, two different techs. And basic, when you look at the bottom line, it's kind of funny. That rotating vane, the old style, nice uh, analog device using your stopwatch or your watch, read pretty good. Because we're looking, we said we took the average of the readings and we said min to max, what's our variation off that average? You know, there was a very slight deviation with the rotating vane. We did a pitot tube, we did a center line reading, and we also did a, a traverse. We say a traverse, that's the open area not of the duct itself. And we got all the different readings there. 
you can see the flow hood without the blast plate was 88% to 121%, worst one in the whole group. When it all came down to the final numbers, the duct traverse measured 113 CFM. So that duct traverse measured 113 CFM, and if you look back, um, the flow hood with the blast plate 134, flow hood average without the blast plate 177. We have to take the area times those velocities, and it starts coming back through, and then that's where we develop that correction factor. And so, okay, by the duct traverse and using this type of device, what kind of correction factor? So if we went through and used a rotating vane, we're gonna use a 1.078. Make a note, this was measured with a rotating vane because we couldn't get a duct traverse on all of them. There are a lot of them there, we had to find another way to measure it coming out the nozzle. Um, but that's how we developed that factor. We base it off the, the duct traverse. And that's how your equipment manufacturers of uh, the tab instrumentation is gonna tell you what to do. Do a duct traverse, that's your accurate. Now you can set a factor off to that hood or that other device, whatever we're gonna use. So you can see off of that, different ways to approach flow measurement, but we're gonna go back to the duct traverses, number one, and then work off of it from there to figure out how can we get the other ones done that we can't get a duct traverse. Uh, my guess is, a uh, gentleman in our office did all this, set it all up that hopefully it'll be published in Tab Journal, because it also takes into account if you start deflecting the nozzle and some things like that that get very interesting. So, one thing like we mentioned earlier, to get accurate data and we want tight tolerances, if you want tight tolerances, we need better balancing dampers. So, keeping in mind, one, a balancing damper is not a shut-off damper. If you have enough static pressure behind that damper, um, boy, you get above a half inch, you're ne definitely not gonna get shut off. You're, you're probably gonna have 50 CFM, if not more, through a balancing damper 100% closed. Definitely with the one with the lower right. Not gasketed, no seals or anything. The one to the left, prefab duct tap uh, is the one above. You know, so those have um, nylons or bushings off the dampers so that that helps seal airflow there, um, but also a lot more controllable. The other thing you look at when you look at dampers that's very helpful, the standoffs. So when it's externally wrapped with insulation, you don't bury that other little handle that you can never find in that scenario. So external standoffs are really, really nice. And then look at the location. If you locate your damper farther away from the duct main, you build more static, but you don't divert a lot of flow back into your main duct, okay? So the closer we are to the main, the better off we are at being able to push airflow around through a system. The farther off the main, the worse we are about pushing airflow through a system. Plus, a lot of the closer the outlet, the closer the damper is, a lot of times you have noise problems. So, a lot of times, hey, move that one damper back on that long duct run on the bottom back closer to the tap in that scenario. So, uh, typical scenario, because most likely that could be the one outlet getting the easiest airflow, even though it's the farthest away, because you got the straight run coming down. We'll have what we call blow by to a point on those first two outlets. We're gonna have to damper down, build up static in that system to get airflow to those first two outlets. Speaking of uh, dampers and locations, uh, one of the things I think might be the only thing, and I'll, I'll still stay with my 99%, but not 100%, don't use face dampers. Um, they build static, they do not divert airflow. Uh, you can decrease airflow, you're definitely not gonna get 100% shut off if you need it or close to it. Um, they're noisy, they get dirty, the worst part of all of it, the owner has access to them. Um, so they will, hey, I don't like this, and they'll start changing things. Um, I'm guilty when I come into a hotel, and I look and I see I got my restroom, and I look and say, man, it's kind of stagnant in here, and I'll see a face damper in there. I might open it. I might. Yeah. You have access to it, and the owner has access to it. They're probably going to change it if they don't like it. So one. But two, you don't get a lot of balancing out of it. That's the biggest problem we see. Um, and then the other part is, once you start closing that face damper and start doing some things, you know, we can't get the hood on it to get a good reading. We're gonna get a face velocity, but you start changing that um, damper setting on there, you've changed your open area, so what's now your open area to take your face velocity times to get an airflow? Not possible, so a lot of times it's very difficult to get that. 
So if you're stuck in a situation and the only thing you do is put in face dampers, if you get on your main branch serving all those, put a branch damper there to cut down most of your airflow to the branch for total, trim out with your face, face dampers, things like that. But try to stay away from face dampers if at all possible. We're doing on time, okay. Um, equipment selection, equipment ID. Uh, probably a pet peeve of mine in the aspects if you get a schedule that has VAV A through D. You open up the drawings, there's an A, there's another A, there's a D, there's 16 Ds there. There's no individual identification of the different VAVs. Creates a lot of problems on a job uh, with coordination, one, during construction, and two, for the owner when they get it turned over to them because if the DDC guy and the balancer didn't talk and say, hey, how are you going to label them? How are we going to label them so our report can at least match your DDC system, which is helpful? Then that makes a difference. But then again, does he end up knowing what D-211 is? Well, probably room 211 maybe. But if you look at those drawings, you talk to that design professional. Um, sometimes it hasn't gone real well. <laughs> I had the mechanical guy just start chewing on me, this and that. Thank goodness the electrical guy was in there. He sat back and said, hold on, stop. I am sick and tired of doing your work for you because when I do my electrical schedule for all my heat pumps, I've got to go through and identify every one on my circuits. You haven't identified one. Now how do I know your right heat pump's getting connected to my right circuit? Start identifying your heat pumps. And I was like, okay, that went well. Um, and that side. So, but once you get everybody talking about it, you're going to find out the majority of the people realize we need individual identification. Um, you know, the, the Table on the left or the schedule up there, VAV 11-1, that's, that's air handler 11, VAV 1 on air handler 11. Great way to go through if you've got a lot of air handlers and a lot of uh, VAVs. So, Access challenges, um, oh, they didn't update the slide. Um, you know, place like this, getting up high, doing things like that, architectural features, sheetrock ceilings. Um, by the time we get that job ready to balance, the seats are probably all installed. So how are we going to get up to that duct? How are we going to get up to there? Because that unit's not in operation yet. Um, a new one that we're running into quite a bit with all the pharmacy upgrades and the pharmacy updates to meet USB's new standards, fan filter units. And fan filter units have their fan controls on them. And the slide I had a picture of the one with the controls all on top of the fan filter unit. So you got to get up through the access door, get up there and try to get your hand up there and figure out what you're touching to get to that access control. Fan filter unit manufacturers have started to listen. So they moved them down now to the room. Some of them actually will have a display of the fan speed or CFM on the side so you can see that. Oh, but to change fan speeds, you got to pull the HEPA filter up. So they're close. The other thing that they'll just promote now right now is uh, the remote connection for control. So uh, back net, whole nother subject, but that's an option. Uh, a lot of them will have a variable speed controller with a zero to 10 on the wall that you can just put a device on to control fan speed and that thing. Stepping back to one other side now, go back to our duct traverse. If you have primary airflow going to that fan filter unit, uh, a lot of times they're served by VAVs and you're getting primary air to that fan filter unit. If we can, get in there early before all the sheetrock ceilings in. Calibrate your VAV, get your VAV set up, then connect the fan filter unit to it. Uh, that way at least you got a good calibration on the VAV with the duct traverse um, and that side. So, or access doors to your ductwork. So access is always a big thing to think about when you're looking at design reviews, going through it, working with people and saying, we're gonna need access here or there to get to the different things. Pressure independent control valves, that didn't get up. Uh, good presentation from Belimo yesterday on pressure independent control valves. Biggest thing is understand what they're doing, how they're doing what they're doing, and how to utilize them. Um, they have made leaps and bounds in their technology and how they operate um, from probably just five to seven years ago. Um, you know, this slide will say they typically don't measure water flow. Now they've got them with an ultrasonic meter connected to them, and they're going to control to water flow. Now we're truly getting into a really pressure independent type system when you want to compare it to a VAV. If you're not measuring water flow, 
then it's tough to compare it to a VAV because the VAV is reporting an airflow and controlling a damper to an airflow. A pressure independent control valve with no flow measurement is not doing that. It's just regulating a pressure at the inlet of the valve to let the control valve have a stable operating pressure. The biggest caveat in the test and balance world is what is the flow going through that valve? We don't know. All we can tell you is they'll give you test ports on a lot of them. And that test port will tell you uh, 0 to 50 PSI, 0 to 25 PSI, and it'll give you an operating range. That operating range is not saying like an automatic flow living device, hey, I've got 7 GPM now. It's telling you it's operating pressure independently. That 0 to 50 PSI number, whatever, on a pressure independent control valve just says I'm operating pressure independently. To measure flow, they'll tell you, you'll go through their balance procedure in that, test total flow by accurate method, asterisk, accurate method, calibrated circuit balancing valve on main lines, keep that in mind, orifice, venturi, equipment pressure drops if your system's clean, ultrasonic flow meter, maybe a pump curve, or maybe a triple duty or multi-purpose valve. Um, they say calibrated circuit setters on main lines because one of their Checklist is no automatic or manual balancing valves exist. If they do exist, maybe set fully open, locked to not interfere with the pressure and dependency of the, of the control valve. So they don't like balancing valves installed with the pressure independent control valve. So put one on the main branch going out to five or six, get your main flow set there, then go check your PSI to make sure they're all operating pressure independently. So there's some ways you can work around, but always keep in mind if there's pressure independent control valves, there might not be a flow reported with every uh, pressure and advanced control valve in the balance report. So uh, things to work through. That they've got a great application, great opportunities to do some things with them. Just be careful with how they're applied and that kind of thing. One of the things that they will say, they have a higher pressure drop. So they're getting better about that, but they do have a high pressure drop in certain applications and certain sizes, as well as their accuracy is 5% to 17%, depending on uh, situations in that. So um, domestic water systems. One thing in domestic water systems, um, non-invasive method. Tab instrumentation, the stuff you can't read on the right, that's out of tab manuals, Alnor's, Short Ridge. They're not rated for potable water use. So you don't want the tab guy sticking his instruments in that potable water. Um, do it by non-invasive method. Ultrasonic temperatures, if you have a large hot water research system, put on your DDC system and put temperature sensors off each one of your main branches. Set it up to get your 120 degrees off of that. Uh, maintenance guy loves it when he ends up with it because now he can just look real quick and make sure his hot water research system's working right because he's got 120 on all his sensors. So to keep that in mind with domestic water, lab water, and that kind of thing, we don't want to plug our instrumentation into that system. Pump curves, quick, simple. Flat curve, if we're operating at 75 feet, what's my water flow? Ballpark guess. Pump curve steep, we can actually now get a good water flow. So, um, old days, uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, VFDs were not prevalent. They were expensive. Uh, we'd go flat pump curves to ride the curve for the system. Now with VFDs, hopefully we can get a little more steepness to the curve and we can get some things so we need an actual water flow measurement for a pump. Uh, we mentioned the triple duty valves or multi-purpose valves. Valve sizing, the only thing you have to be careful with right now in water valves is those calibrated valves valves now, they don't size it by the pipe size anymore. They will, you can have a half inch balancing valve that has three different orifices in it so you have a 2 to 5 GPM, a 5 to 10 GPM, and a 10 to 12 GPM that's in a half inch or whatever. They'll have different size ranges. We just have to make sure the contractor installs the right one in the right spot and it's tagged correctly with the manufacturer. Multi-purpose triple duty valves, those guys there, you need a minimum of three feet on one manufacturer, another manufacturer's five feet of pressure drop across that valve. 99% of the time, they're line size. Whatever I'm coming off my pump, my flange, up to my pipe, it's line size. 99% of the time they're oversized, so you won't get a measurement off of them that's gonna be accurate. We'll be less than that three or five feet. Automatic flow limiting devices have gotten a lot better. Uh, 
I think it's personal preference for a lot of people. Uh, you do a lot of remodels or you're planning remodels. You're a university that does a lot of remodels in their building typically. They repurpose their buildings a lot. Automatic pool learning devices could be a great option in those scenarios. Um, there's a couple manufacturers out there that will even give you a third test port. And that third test port is going to let you measure across an orifice device of that automatic flow limiting device to actually tell you what that is regulating to, that it's correct. So a lot of good things to look at. Uh, phasing jobs and looking at different phase jobs. A lot of times they'll help a lot of times with a large water system. But they're going to open up this section first. If you have your AFLDs, you know what your DP set point on your pump is. Measure them all out. As long as you have that DP set point available, you're probably going to make all your auto flows again. So different ways of looking at some remodels and some of that. Biggest thing, factory packaged. This is what you get a lot of times, factory packaged. Test ports into the control valve, test ports into the fan housing, test ports into the wall of the unit. Can't use them. So uh, a lot of times manufacturers, got, they, they're pushing units out the door. They're putting them in, they're just going. They get put in in that fashion. So pre-demo, pre-engineering, pre-construction readings become very, very prevalent now. Uh, a lot of remodels, a lot of retrofits. Our wonderful situation two years ago, we're turning everything into negative pressure rooms. So it's just a matter of what do you really want and what are you looking for? Um, a lot of times we get involved and we'll get involved in pre-construction or pre-demolition readings and we're out there taking readings. Finding out those readings should have been pre-engineering readings because what's designed isn't going to work with what we're getting for numbers. So work with the engineering community, push them more to pre-engineering readings. Because the other thing they're going to find out also, majority of the time, belts aren't on, uh, breakers are tripped, equipment's not even in operation that they are thinking is in operation. Saves them faced with the owner at that point of saying, oh yeah, we just found out this unit's not been in operation for two years, even though we designed to reuse it. Because you said, here's the drawings, here's what we have to work with. So, the more you can push, I think, towards pre-engineering, the more beneficial they can become in that scenario. The caveat is getting out there and looking and saying, if I got a pneumatically controlled VAV system and I want to get a total air handling unit measurement, how am I going to blow all these VAVs to max airflow? Um, don't do what we did. Uh, pull control air and let the VAVs go to max, which they, most of them did. Put control air back on and most of them didn't come back. <laughs> Your pneumatics are old and sometimes not going to all work all right. So thank goodness it was a DDC replacement. So they just had to live with too much airflow for quite a while until they got all the DDC controls in. Scheduling challenges, biggest thing. Uh, I can tell you this, as commissioning is becoming more and more prevalent on projects, our scheduling is becoming much better because the commissioner is getting involved up early up front saying, I need this much time. Tab guy needs this much time. So when you turn over at X point, I need this much time before that turnover. So it's just working to communicate and getting involved early. Once again, you get involved in document reviews early. That helps a lot to bring up the scheduling on that side. Get the scheduling going before the general's hired. Big, big help. Quick thing on scheduling challenges. You know, we have the different phases and areas. The one thing we've learned, air systems, variable volume boxes. Put in VAVs in areas. If that area is going to be phased, even if you're doing it to a whole area, put a couple of VAVs in. Calibrate, set those VAVs, balance your outlets. You should never have to go back to it as long as you're making your static pressure to the inlet of that VAV. Now they can keep going with the rest of their remodel off that system. So tab reports, I'd say the biggest thing I'd say, avoid matching numbers. And then the biggest thing is that pristine report that always looks perfect. In my mind, that's the one that gets rejected. The one that doesn't get rejected is the one that's telling you exactly what you have and what you have to work with. You know, because a lot of times I, uh, we cannot get the design numbers, and we're going to try to work with you before the report to say, hey, what do we have? Here's what we've got. What can we do? But it's going to be a benchmark. Uh, the gentleman I bought the business from years ago said it's like the accountant. He's going to do all your taxes, do everything based on what you did that year, but he's not going to pay your taxes. You know, we're going to do everything we can to get design airflow and get design intent, but there might be some caveats that says it doesn't have it. Everybody needs to know why it isn't working or what the numbers are. So if there is a problem, they can look right away and say, oh, we don't have design airflow.
instead of saying, oh, we got design airflow, what's the problem? You know, going through everything else. So, kind of rush through the last couple to get us through. Any questions, comments? Yes? I can speak loud enough. Can you go back to the pig fee slide? There was a bullet point that got kind of cut off at the bottom. I was wondering what that said. Uh, probably one that should have been deleted on the updated slide. Yeah, right there. Like, manufacturers should always give us more money because we're better engineers. Exactly. Yeah, that one. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah, so no, um, basically it's just that caution statement of the, the technology is changing so much right now with it that keeping up with and understanding what you're getting. Um, so many engineers I've talked to have said, hey, just read that test board. It'll tell me what I have for the water flow. No, it tells you it's operating pressure independently. You know, and then looking at the sizing of them and, and the different caveats. But, um, you know, even the guy from the Lumineer said, said, do you really need to have on all your VAV reheats a ultrasonic meter or ploy even a 1.5 GPM? Because maybe you do one at the branch or something in that side. So trying to get that happy balance of what's going to work and that kind of thing. Um, definitely don't use it for open close. We had a whole job on heat pumps. Compressor comes on, opens the valve, compressor goes off, closes the valve. They had pick V's on all of them. So... And I don't know what, you know, he went the cost difference between one with a flow meter and one without, but I don't know what the difference is between a control valve, balancing valve, and pick V. So, yes? As far as a, I'm a permission provider, and in our region, we rarely see the tab contractor or the tab provider involved in the design process. Okay. Um, we, one of the first things we ask when we start developing the commissioning team as who's your tab provider and they're like, oh well that's that's under mechanical contractor. We'll we'll get we'll bring them in later. Right. And so as a commission provider, we try to look for some of those things, but you know, we're not I'm not a tab professional, so I'm not looking right. in detail for you know everything right. that you guys would look for. How do we get that to a place where we can <laughs> So it's the toughest thing because like I said, a lot of times it's hired under the mechanical and a lot of times the mechanic says, oh, I don't need to get that contract out. He's at the end of the job, right. et cetera, et cetera. So our push has been uh, hire us early. So we go see a lot of the, me the mechanical contractors said, get us a contract as soon as you get a contract number one. Um, and then on, I would say a lot of times when you have a user who has multiple facilities, colleges, uh, K through 12 school districts, um, campus facilities of any sorts, uh, your cities, city buildings, push that they hire the tab direct and that side. So that's the optimal scenario. So the more they can get involved early on, knowing a project's coming up, the better it is. But you're absolutely correct. That's probably one of the biggest hurdles is getting that tab guy on board. Anything else? Yes? Oh, yes. Um, we like to get a traverse of that tap going into the floor. Um, a lot of times we just had one up at Iowa State where they ended up extending that ductwork under the floor enough to get us to where we get a traverse to get that measurement under the floor so we can get the airflow. But at that point, um, they had control dampers that were controlling to a plenum pressure. So once we established we had all the right flow, had enough flow from the system, it was kind of turned under control. It's controlled to a plenum pressure of what, 0.05 in that side. So, um, and then all the individual outlets, uh, that's the hardest part. So uh, we spot checked the initial layout for them uh, and then tried to develop a factor with the hood Then pretty much came up to the point and said, hey, this number's a number. And all we can do is say, when you put more in or less in, we can look and say if you're getting that same number available in that side. So, yeah. Anything else? Great. Thanks for showing up. Appreciate it. Appreciate the feedback. Uh,